This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to the final show for 2017 of Condo Insider. It's hard to believe that this show began about two years ago and we'll be going into our third year in 2018 of making our good faith efforts of trying to provide useful information to board members and owners who live in an association. And I thought it might be fun today to review 2017. I've asked my co-host, Jane Sugimura, to join me, and we're gonna talk about the year 2017 and kind of what happened this year. And I wanna thank Jane for all she does in the industry. You're a real powerhouse in the industry, and I know you're president of Hawaii Council of Community Associations. So remind everybody who HCCA is. Okay, HCCA is an organization of condo, we represent condo associations and unit owners and uh, people in the industry like uh, you know you and you know y your people at uh, Associa, and um, we um, educate about condo um, uh, legislation and we advocate for the rights of condo owners and management. It's important people know that anybody can join HCCA. Yes, they can anybody. be an owner, they can be a board member, they can be a vendor. And we're one of the few organizations that really don't take donations from anybody, including the Real Estate Commission. We generate all of our efforts through our educational program where we make a little bit of money to help sustain our efforts. So uh, we're very picky to make sure we're a neutral organization in fighting for good things for the industry. Yes, and we're very proud of that. Yeah, I am proud of that too. You know, one of the things that surprised me last year and it's kind of been growing every year, but last year was, I never saw, I think we had over 150 bills introduced in January 2017 yeah. that affected association living. What happened? What, what, why are all these bills being introduced? I, I don't know, I, I think it's crazy. And you know what I think it does? It, it, I think it demonstrates that, that people are not communicating because you would think that you know, unit owners, uh, you know, they live in the building with their board, and if they had an issue, that they'd be able to talk to their board uh, or their management and try to resolve it. And for some reason, it's not happening. And I don't think it's, it, it's, it's happening wide scale. I think it's only happening in certain buildings. And so we just have to you know, improve our education and dispute resolution uh, options. Well, there were three kind of notable areas that uh, last year that failed. But the most dominant one, which kind of goes right on point to what you're talking about, was there was some belief that by having an ombudsman, a state-regulated industry, to manage condo associations or be responsible, almost with a view that this agency could overturn the decisions of the board, was one that failed. What's your take on all that? I think, I think that it failed because it, 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 it disregards the, the foundation of what's, you know, what makes up the condo legislation, 514A and B, is self-governance. In other words, the owners of a, a condominium are the ones who select their board members uh, to manage and uh, run the project and to, to, to get higher consultants. And, and, and if there are any issues, it should be handled internally by the people who live in the building talking to the people who manage the building. But for some reason, that's not happening. Yeah, because of the, the tension that's got, I took a lot of time looking at what other states do last year. And then directly, we have an ombudsman in the form of RICO, and if there were some things we wanted to change, we could do slight amendments to the law to give RICO more authority. But I see the same thing. You have people thinking they don't like the decision of their board, their elected board, and so they want someone else to come in and say you're wrong and do it my way. Right. And I don't think that's ever going to fly. No, you know, because there are provisions in the statute and in their own declaration for their building that says that this is the way things are going to be done. You, you vote for a board to manage the building. If you don't like the board, you can remove them. And you don't have to wait for an election. You can have a special meeting. And the statute and most declarations and bylaws have the provisions in there on how you have a special meeting to remove your, your directors without an annual meeting. Well, it kind of ties into that from the same uh, people who had this initiative. They wanted to, as you know, we have management companies who have condominium association managers appointed who get education through CAI and HCCA and many other organizations, IRAM, for example, and they wanted to mandate 
because we're an agent, they kind of thought about real estate agents and condominium managing agents are the same, and they're very, very different. And what education requires is different. They wanted mandatory licensing that somehow that these managers would have to be, in one case, the law said a real estate broker, but it's kind of apples and oranges. Well, you know, the way I saw that, you know, they're trying to fix blame. They want, they want somebody to be accountable. And I think what people have to understand is they have to you remember the buck stops with them. They are, they are the unit owners in a building. If they, you know, they're the ones who choose the directors and the directors, you know, represent the majority of the people. And, you know, and so if you're not in the majority, then you've got to make yourself the majority. You've got to go out and talk to the, your other unit owners, even if they don't, you know, live on site. And there's a way you can get the, the unit owner to stress. You can ask your association for an owner's list. If you're a unit owner, you can get that information. The statute says you can get it, and you can contact them, and you can lobby them and persuade them that, that you know, you're right, and they should vote for you and give, give you their proxies, and, and then you can uh, change the people on the board. I mean, that's how it's supposed to be done. It's like a mini government. It's like if you don't like what your uh, elected officials are doing, you unelect them at the next election. And related to that, which is, uh, to me, um, uh, back to fixing blame and everything's wrong, everything is broken. And, and I have some sympathy for this. They wanted a form of education required for board members. Now, remember, these are volunteers, and some of them are very small projects and don't have much uh, uh, really going on with them. But they wanted a mandatory education to the point even that you had to have these mandatory classes, but you also had to submit personal financial statements because they wanted to make sure you didn't have a conflict of interest, which is a little bit over the top for me, but I can see, as we're trying to do at Condo Insider and what we're trying to do with the HCCA seminars, we're making good faith efforts to try to educate people, and maybe there's some things we can do to make it better, but it all kind of blends together, a state agency to oversee the boards, mandatory licensing, because we want you responsible, or an agent can't override what the principal's saying, and then mandatory education, it's like fixing blame again. Mm -hmm. So how do you see that, same thing? Same thing, and, and, and in a way, you know, there are ways to do this, and, and, and one of the things is to, is to educate the board members. When you sit on a board, you have officers and directors insurance, and, and so if you do your job, uh, then if, if, if in case a unit owner gets upset and wants to sue you, your insurance will cover you. And, but, you know, I think what, what we need to do is to educate these, and, and I, I know we've had programs, about how you know how to avoid getting sued if you're a board member, and but you know I think we have to put more emphasis on it so that board members know, you know, are you know, are aware that they can be sued and they have to take steps to protect themselves, which means following the business judgment rule and you know asking outside experts and, and you know voting independently, you know not because they're the best friends of the the board president. Or um, you know, but, but they they need to act independently for the be in the best interest of of the unit owners, so that they don't get sued, and and and, and I think the the way to avoid all of this all of this plus the you know lawsuits that you know usually uh, entail is education, and uh, and now with technology, I mean there's a way for us to deliver education to people w without them having to attend seminars. They can just turn on their their device, their phone, right? With YouTube programs like our program here, I mean, they can look at look at the shows on a, on a on a phone or on a tablet, any time of the day or night, and they can pro you know you, you can probably log in and say you know I certify that I have seen this program, and and that's it. I think you're the nail on head also about communication and we. With the end of the show, if we have time, we'll talk briefly about dispute resolution. But we put a lot of effort this past year on trying to get people aware of the various dispute resolution mechanisms we have. Part of, part of them are funded by the continuing education fund, so it doesn't cost anybody much money to try to resolve disputes among themselves. But let's talk briefly about what did pass this year okay. in 2017. I know there's five bills, and we don't have time to go through them in detail, but let's just kind of review the five things we did accomplish this year as an industry to make our industry better for homeowners and boards alike, beginning with proxies. Okay, 
and, and what we heard, and, and a lot of what we do in the legislature is based on what we heard, what we hear from the community. And the community was telling us that, you know, when, when, when proxies were submitted, and if, they were, if they, the wrong boxes were checked, or if two boxes were checked, that somehow those proxies went to the board, which is wrong, and the statute doesn't provide for that. So all we did was clarify and said, you know, if you check the wrong box, or you check more than one, so it, in effect, it's a defective proxy. It goes to nobody. It only goes to establish a quorum at the meeting. Right. So the boards can't take that and use it to gain right. voting power. Right. The second thing that kind of came out, which uh, is, again, back to being heard, is that at board meetings, boards must establish meeting rules to allow reasonable participation of its owners, its members, in the board meetings. It's not just at the forum in the beginning. They need to have reasonable rules to allow them to participate during a board meeting and get their views accomplished without disrupting the board and preventing them from getting their business done. So the big issue on the board meetings was that you have to have established written meeting rules to allow owner participation. And the board should welcome that because, after all, they're elected by the owners. Right. And, yeah. you know, just, I just want to add to that because after that bill passed, what I heard was some, some and it was passed in... May, I think the, the governor signed it in June or July. Even after the governor signed that bill, there were some boards that took the position that, oh, we can't let you speak because we haven't made our rules yet. Because the statute did talk about making reasonable rules. And so they used that as uh, an excuse for not letting people talk, even though the, you know, some of the people knew that the, the law had passed and they tried to speak at meetings. And you know, my response to them, and I think we addressed it at one of our luncheons is if this is happening in your association and you tell your board that they're wrong, that, that you can speak at the meeting even though they haven't done the rules. It's that, you know, they can make the rules, you know, at, at, you know whenever they want to, but they need to let you speak because the bill has been signed. It's a, it is in place. Well, a couple of three minutes will be coming up on a break. So I want to try to get the other three bills done in three minutes because we have such a heavy agenda today. Employment contracts of, of the general manager, site manager. Right. What's the new rule? That they, they, you have to produce them. You have to produce them. And also, tenants can't serve on boards as directors. And uh, the last thing would be the repeal of 514A. And, that, and the repeal is effective on January 1, 2019. Now, let me comment about that particularly, because the Real Estate Commission has been sending out letters to all the board presidents saying, this is to advise you. And of course, if you're a developer with unsold units that are, was filed the public report under 514A, there's certain very other limited circumstances that may have an impact on you. But for all practical purposes, boards that receive that letter have nothing to do. Right. If, unless they, they have a developer-controlled association that's still under 514A or something along that line. It's just a notice letter, but boards themselves have nothing to do. They have no notices to give to the owners. It's an informational letter went out. It has really no effect for the established associations here in Hawaii. Right. Well, you know, and one, one other thing, too, and, and this question was brought to me, you know, now that the 514A is going to be repealed, it's going to be, even though it's, it's not effective until uh, January 1, do we still have to do the opt-in? And I'm saying, well, no, I, I, I would not you know, worry about the opting in because for all intents and purposes, 514A, the governance sections are probably, you know, it's, it's overridden by the fact that 514B is in place. And there is language in 514B that says this applies to all existing condominiums. And the only reason why you have the opt in was because you had 514A and that opting in would just basically be insurance. Right. If you were established under 514A. Yeah, that's what we're telling our associations who are 514A as well. No sense spending the money in written consents and doing all that. Let the law take effect a year later because the governance section is identical in both statutes right. anyway. So uh, why spend the money uh, to, to take care of that? Okay, what we're going to do is we're at the midway part of the show. I want to come back and talk about the one bill that's in the conference committee still and then go on to the biggest fire in Hawaiian history, Marco Polo, and what's going on at the city council. So we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in one minute. Aloha kako. I am Andrea. I am from Italy, and I've been studying and working here in Hawaii for more than three years for my PhD. 
Hawaii is home to a truly fantastic community of middle and high school students. And did you know some of them are currently out there, right now, using their free time to invent new quantum computers? And did you know some of them are exploring cybersecurity and the new frontiers of robotics? I am just always amazed as I talk to them at science fairs. Oh, but there's more. Did you know that these students are coming here on FinTech Hawaii to share their story with us? Come and join the new Young Talents Making Way show and discover how these students are shaping our future. Starting on February the 6th, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Only here at FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're sitting here with my good friend and co-host Jane Sugimura talking to the effect of what happened in 2017, good, bad, and the ugly, I guess we could say. The last thing we talked about was, is there still one bill, as you know, we have a bian biannual legislation, so uh, it goes two years. So there was one bill, House Bill 1499, that was stuck in conference committee, didn't get out, could be coming out of conference committee this year, 1499. What do you think the status of it is and explain to everybody what it is? Okay, 1499 uh, basically um, uh, uh, talks about the priority of payments. The way it is set up now, the priority of payments provision in a condominium uh, uh, declaration and in the statute, uh, you know, in, in, it, it reinforces the fact that you know, condominiums are going to get paid. In other words, if, if you, you be run, start running late on payments, your, your payments are going to be applied to your late charges and any attorney's fees before get applied to the um, um, uh, assessments. And you have to remember that your maintenance fees are assessment. The late charges, attorney's fees, and any penalties and, and things are not assessments. And you know, so it's a matter of definition. And the, the, the proponent of this bill was concerned that certain things were going to foreclosure. And she didn't think it was right that you would, a person could lose their home for non-payment of late charges and you know, penalties. And so basically, the priority of payments basically says, I mean, this, this bill basically says you can't do a foreclosure if that's all it is. You know, it has to be assessments. It has to be your maintenance fees are late. And that if, it, and, and this also says that, you know, if there is a dispute between you and the association, you pay the assessments and you can mediate or arbitrate the attorney's fees and the late charges. And tacked onto that bill are all kinds of stuff that we ended up Somehow it ended up in that bill, our alternative dispute resolution bill. Though the, there's the bill that expanded who could do mediation and arbitration to include board members, because you have board members fighting with other board members, right? And they are technically not covered by the statute. So in mediation and the arbitration statute, that's been expanded to include board members and to include managing agents. And yeah, I think the key word we have to add to that is the word fines as well. It was right. We saw associations, we have kind of pay now, dispute later, so people would kind of thumb their nose at the board, not pay the fine, then they get late fees and legal fees on it. And meanwhile, they had a priority payment, so any fees you paid first went to fines and late fees, right. thus you had a balance due of your assessment, they were getting foreclosed on. And the intent of this bill was to prevent that. Right. That you have to give them notice, they have a right to arbitration mediation, and to go through this process to make sure owners knew what their rights were before this got into a foreclosure right. state. And, and I, do you expect that to come out this year? I do. I, I, in fact, I, ha I had uh, some meetings at the legislature uh, a few weeks ago, and I, I was given assurances that 1499 would come out. And I think that's a good thing. The industry fought for this, saying that we want balance between a board's rights and a homeowner's rights. That, uh, people need to know that there are consequences for not paying their fines or paying their maintenance fees on times, but let's stop it before it gets to foreclosure until we've gone through a meaningful uh, dispute resolution process to uh, try to resolve it. And I right. think that was the intent of the bill. But as a reminder to all the homeowners, you still got to pay your maintenance fees. Right. You, can't, you, you can't use that statute for that. Let's go on to the hot topic. I hate to call it a hot topic, yeah. kind of the Marco Polo fire. Yeah. We read today in the paper, you know, they were talking again about uh, the bill trying to legislate on 
certain types of uh, condos or high-rise buildings mandatory uh, fire sprinkler systems. And there's a lot of pushback because of the cost. Where's that all stand with the, uh, I know the city council had two bills, um, Bill uh, 69 and 107, I think they are, yeah. uh, that deals it's, with this. Where's that stand? 69 is the mandatory bill introduced by the mayor. And it, it says that sprinklers should, would be in all high-rise buildings within five years. Okay, that one I think is dead. I think it, it, for all intents and purposes, it's dead. 107 is the revision uh, by the uh, Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee, uh, and uh, that takes the recommendations by that committee. And that bill sets up something called the Life Safety Evaluation, which all buildings would have to you know, go through. And the, uh, the, fi and the fire department led the task force. And what that does is it exempted, out of 361 buildings, high-rise buildings in town, it exempted uh, all buildings that open onto exterior quarters that are you know, open and any buildings that are less than 10 stories. So now you're down to 52 buildings, okay? 52 buildings and a life safety evaluation that all the buildings have to go through to m make sure that they're safe. And that life safety evaluation and the tool that you use to measure it is called, we call it the matrix. It's online on the city website. So that, and all the buildings, you know, and, and, and with, through this show and through our seminars, you know, we've been telling people, it's on the city website, it's on the city website, please go and look at it, and then go and take a look at your building and see how you can do it. And let me tell you, there was a hearing on December 18th, and it was packed at the city. The, cha the, uh, the hearing chambers were just packed, and they were all in the hallway. And I, I was so proud of the people who came. They came and they testified, all, all of them. I mean, they, two or three minutes, but they said, I, you know, I, I, I sit on the board and I'm from this building and we had this many units and we've you know, done this. We've checked our fire uh, alarms and our elevators. We've upgraded our elevators and we've closed in our very vertical openings. I mean, they're looking at the, 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 the matrix. You know, so, and they said, we were doing, and we did all these things before the Marco Polo fire, and after the Marco Polo, we did not done more. And, you know, when we bought into the building, we knew there were no fire sprinklers. And so we have assumed a risk uh, of, of the fact that there are no sprinklers. And we don't want the government telling us, you know, uh, what, what we can and should do. You should leave it to us uh, to, to make those decisions. And, 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 you know, I'm paraphrasing, but that's the gist of what people were saying. There's a practical side to this. I mean, no one can argue fire safety. We don't want to lose lives. But when you take old buildings, there becomes a lot of structural issues and, and, and engineering issues that affect it. For example, to have a high-rise building with a uh, fire sprinkler system, you need a minimum of 10 by 10 room for the fire pump. Right. Well, there may be buildings that don't have 10 by 10 room or larger for a fire pump. Right, and, they, <laughs> and they, their, their, their footprint has taken up all of the usable space on their property, so now they got to apply for a variance from the city and, if they want to add the pump room. And I know nothing, but I saw estimates from four to, I don't want to say $12,000 to put a sprinkler system in. Well, now it doesn't take into consideration what if you have has asbestos abatement or lead paint abatement. I mean, you know, people I've talked to who are engineers in this field said, some of these buildings may be thirty, forty, or fifty thousand dollars a unit to put a fire sprinkler system in, which equates to about four to five hundred dollars a month per unit owner if they had to borrow the money to borrow the building. I'm not sure we're rushing to get this done. I understand the sense of urgency, but I don't know if we thought this through really well. And I think that's the that is the concern of some of the uh, council members, uh, and you know, and they're getting all kinds of calls from their constituents about the cost. And the fact that, you know, the, the same buildings that are being told that they have to put, you know, they may have to comply with mandatory installation of fire sprinklers. I mean, they're being faced with, you know, uh, uh, huge capital improvements that, you know, call for spall repairs, replacing their pipes. I mean, these are not cheap capital improvements. And, and they have to be done because these buildings are old already. What well, is the worst scenario, because the older buildings are going to have to deal one the ones that don't have the new fire code right. sprinklers. They're the ones that are dealing with the cast iron sewage pipes. They're the ones dealing with the electrical system, with the spall repair because they're older buildings. And so you throw this on top of it, 
I'm not, I, I certainly support 100% the matrix and requiring everybody to look, because there's things you can do with new sprinklers, uh, or new fire doors, for example, new fire alarm systems, with closing up the pukas that may allow a draft to, to help the fire to accelerate. Right. There's things you can do, but I'm not sure that it shouldn't be left to the buildings themselves to look at what they can best do to provide additional fire safety for the residents than mandating fire sprinklers for everybody, because frankly, I just don't think it's affordable. Well, you know, and you know, the, the, the matrix that they use, I was all, you know, I was representing Hawaii Council on the Fire Safety Advisory Committee. And so they used my building when they were doing the, explaining the matrix. And my building didn't pass with a minus two score. And that's because one of the items on the matrix is the installation of partial sprinklers in the hallway and in the, you know, in the common elements. And, and so they have a minus eight. You start off with a minus eight. So if that minus eight was a zero or a minus one, just like everything else on the matrix, my building would have passed without sprinklers. So it's skewed to fail. It's skewed. That's right. And, 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 you know, Hawaii Council hired engineers to advise us on our position. And they, when they looked at the matrix and they saw the minus eight, they said that that's, that, 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 that's you know, really not supportable that a, a, a zero or a minus one can be installed in there. That way you have buildings like mine because we renovated our elevator two years ago and a lot of buildings already have it on their budget and reserves. And that's one thing that they can start look, looking at doing because they have money socked away for that. They can re renovate their elevators because that way their fire alarms will then have to come up to code and, this, and they have money you know, already budgeted for this repair. A lot of them. Well, we're down to a minute left, so I've got to ask you a question. What do you see 2018 going to be about? I see, um, I, well, first of all, we've got to get this thing resolved with the uh, fire sprinklers. But, you know, I, what I see is we're going to be back in the legislature talking more about dispute resolution because we, we need to get that resolved. We need to get it working so that basically we're forcing people to talk to each other to resolve their differences. Well, let me conclude the show by, first of all, thanking Jane for all you do throughout the year. It's really wonderful to work with you. I really enjoy being a part of Hawaii Council Community Associations and the show here. And I know you're a big advocate of that, so I want to thank you because you've been a tireless worker in our industry for decades. I also want to say to people who watch our show, thank you for watching. Uh, it's been an incredible two years. We hope to continue to make improvements on our show and provide you value well, education, I want to wish all of you a very happy and safe new year and see you again in 2018.